Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining our webinar this evening. Um, my name is Maria Montague, and I'm the Deputy Director of the Ukrainian Institute London. Um, and it is extremely difficult at the moment to find language for anything. <laughs> um, and um, But I feel like the only thing that I can do is keep with the same introduction that I always give um, for our webinars, which is that the Ukrainian Institute London is an independent charity dedicated to broadening knowledge about Ukraine in the UK and beyond. Um, and we do this uh, through lots of ways, through talks and um, events and, um, um, and our Ukrainian Literature in Translation Prize, which we launched last year and which was won by Nina Murray uh, for her translation of Cassandra by Lesia Ukrainka. And we are really looking forward this evening to hearing some of Nina's fantastic translation. And we are joined by a fantastic group of actors um, to, who are going to perform those uh, translations for us. Um, and I'm gonna give a quick introduction to Nina. Uh, and uh, you must just Google her to find out more about her because she's done so much fantastic work. She is a poet and a translator and she's translated works by many amazing Ukrainian writers, including Oksana Zabushko. Um, and she has an upcoming translation of Ivan and Phoebe by Oksana Lutsishina. And um, we hope soon to be published translation of Cassandra by Lesia Ukrainka. Um, so we are going to start quite soon already with the first extract that um, is going to be performed by our fantastic actors. Um, and um, I'm just going to introduce them now uh, briefly. So we have um, Andrea Tudos, Lea Desgarey, Charlie Merriman, Jonathan Lees, and Alona Bach. And um, especially at the time that we're all facing now, I think it's a really important thing to say that three of our actors tonight, this is their second journey into Ukrainian theater um, because uh, Lea, Alona, and Andrea, sorry, I knew I was going to cry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm going to stop crying now. Um, I think <laughs> we, that's absolutely fine. I think. Together. Sorry, I am fine. Um, we were in hard yeah. together um, to perform. I think everybody Kenna. feels the same way. It's only. Thank you, Will Alasia. Um, anyway, I'm just so grateful to you all for being here today um, so that we can listen to Lasia Ukrainka's amazing play because it's fucking amazing. And so was Nina Murray, who translated it. And um, and we had an amazing time in Kharkiv, um, where um, these guys performed the McClana by Mikola Gublish. And um, and so we are going to pass over to Nina now, who is going to do a much better job than me. <laughs> and the other thing that I needed to say is that um, Sasha Dovzik, uh was uh, meant to be moderating now, um, but she can't because she's in Lviv helping loads of people um, to try to get to safety. And she is also absolutely amazing. And um, I will calm down a bit now and pass on to Nina to ask you, how, why did you decide to translate Cassandra by Lassie Ukrainka? Thank you so much, Maria. It's, it's true honor to be here. When this process started, none of us couldn't have imagined, I think, that this is this is where we would be. It was almost exactly a year ago that I saw the advertisement, the, the uh, call for submissions to the translation prize. And at the time, Cassandra is one of my favorite plays. And um, at the time I was working and transitioning from full-time work at the State Department to being a full-time translator. So Cassandra to me was, a kindred spirit as a woman in national security establishment. And I just could not, <laughs> either she could not let go of me or I could not let go of her. And then once I translated the little excerpt that, that went to the, to the contest, I just had, I, I felt like I had to keep going. And the more I kept going, the more topical this play felt. It felt really visceral, it, it, the play, is 115 years old this year, but it's still the main, the main character is an analyst in a threatened country that who is trying to warn her people of impending doom and risks. 
and who is not always successful. And she is also a woman with family and other people that um, she cares about. And she is also an absolutely indomitable spirit, which I hope you will see in the three excerpts that we're about to present. We, of course, would have loved to do the entire play, but I think think that is something that we can hope and dream for and aspire to a little bit later. Um, it is my incredible honor to be doing this for Ukrainian Institute London and with this group of actors. Thank you so much, Nina. Um, so let's move on to the first extract. And can you set the scene for us? Absolutely. So in this first extract, we are going to be in Cassandra's quarters in the palace of King Priam of Troy. Troy has now been under siege by the Greek troops for 10 years. It has been quite a long time. Everybody has been together. Uh, it's a very large group of people. King Priam has 50 daughters and 50 sons. Cassandra is well recognized as a prophetess. Uh, she has a younger sister, Polixena, who is quite young, described in Les Ukrainka's notes as a literally young girl, so she may have been a child when this war started. And um, the other character that we're going to encounter is going to be Andromache, who is the wife of Hector, the leader uh, of the Trojan military. And we shall, I will uh, turn my video on, oh, I'm sorry, I will turn my video off and provide some stage directions. Cassandra's quarters, Cassandra is writing in her sibling book. Cassandra, love, I cannot tell you how blessed I am. I am so happy. He is so handsome, my betrothed Achilles. I see him often from the ramparts. I see him walk across the field. He glows, my Helios, he dazzles. He is now in conflict with the Atreides. He wants to live in peace with our father. Our marriage will not fail to bear fruit, all say so. The Greeks as much as the Trojans, its issue will be peaceful rule and power. The sacred Troy will stand, we, Priam's great nation will carry on. My dear sister, I apologize. I cannot speak with you now. You see, I have to write this book. I must attend to golden-haired Apollo. Cassandra, it is unattractive when you are jealous of your sister. It's not my fault Achilles chose me, nor you. A girl does no choosing. Neither is it my fault if the gods of love do not hold you in their blessed favor. No, Polixena, I do not envy you. I'm sorry, sweetie, I offended you. I'm so happy I have just forgotten that talk of marriage hurts you. I know better. You were hurt so deeply when that unfaithful Dolon broke up with you. Polixena, don't mention, I knew well I would not be the wife of Dolon. And why did you accept his gifts? because I loved him. Those gifts, they were the only things he had to give me. Why would I not have taken what was offered? He gave them with an honest heart and I accepted so that I would have a souvenir of happy days. They would not, I knew, be many. Look, I still have this golden snake I wear on my arm. It wraps around it, just like the thought of him around my heart. Dolon is not to blame. The fault entirely is in these eyes of mine. They did not know how to say, I love you. Even when my heart could burst with love. Dolan did fear them. He told me my eyes slay our chance at happiness with cold, hard swords. They remain unchanged before the gods and my beloved. He simply could not overcome these eyes. No matter how hard he tried to wrestle their gaze away from mystery and onto life. 
These eyes were my undoing, and I knew it. But what to do? <laughs> Go blind? A hawk can never gaze upon the world same as a cooing dove. Polixena, do not look at me so. Don't speak, don't ask me, don't you dare. You know I love you more than all my sisters. Do not speak. I won't, Cassandra. I can't have you think of me as hostile to you like the others. It is not your fault that you are ill, that gods have fogged your mind in such a way that you see evil where there is no hint of it and rob people of joy, that you rob yourself. Oh, sweetie, I'm so sorry. Sits down on a low bench in front of Cassandra. Here, sister, brush out my hair. Mother told me to have it neat, but look, it's tangled and I can't quite reach the flowers. Here's Pulls a comb. out a golden comb and a small round hand mirror. Here's a comb. Hands the comb to Cassandra, who takes it obediently and begins to untie the ribbons and loosen flowers out of Polixena's hair. Polixena looks in the mirror. She is so good, my sister. The jealous gods must needs select the best to be their tribute. She would be better off if I could take her life right now with my sacred knife and save her all the sorrow. Cassandra, I can't help but be afraid. Why do you look so? What are you whispering? Don't mind me, dear. Nothing. You said I must be ill. I think I must be. I have to be. Don't mind me. I just thought of Troilus, our brother. You two were so alike. When he was killed, he lay so quiet, peaceful, handsome. Polixena, do you not recall whose hand it was that plunged the sword into our brother's heart. Cassandra, must you bring it up? We are at war. Yes, war. One kills the brother, then takes the sister as his bride. Our brother is dead and gone. I barely remember what he was like. Achilles, too, did not know who he had killed. Yes, as we're all aware. Another thing Achilles must not know is that exactly when he called for envoys to ask your hand in marriage from our father, our brother Hector asked the council for a plan to torch the enemy's ships. While you were braiding these pomegranate flowers into your hair, Hector was putting on his helmet. So what? He won't attack the Myrmidons. Achilles does not care, neither do I. Sisters, have you heard? My Hector, they report, has slain Patrocles. Patrocles was Achilles' best friend. Woe upon us. Blood and vengeance. Here goes your marriage, poor Polixena. Takes a pair of scissors and cuts off Polixena's hair. Ow! Polixena, where are our mourning garments? You're mad, what have you done? Andromache, sisters wear mourning for their brothers. Widows wear weeds for their husband. An orphan baby dies in their swaddling clothes. Go mute, fearmonger. Why did you not tell me that grief was in the offing? I could have, Hector could have been stopped. Oh, Polixena, I, I can sense it. I, I see disaster coming, but can't show it. I, I cannot say watch here or over there. I only know when it is already and cannot be escaped. When no one can do anything at all. If only I could see otherwise, I'd have stopped it myself. You could have, if you had said to Hector, do not go. Yes, you knew. Then why did you not speak? And if I had who would have believed me you've made that hard to do indeed you always prophecy out of place and for no apparent reason you always foretell grief but never why it comes or who will bring it only because i do not know these things polixena that is just words and, and how can we believe them 
It's not just words. I see it. All of the things of which I speak, I see them, sisters. I see Troy falls. But why? Who takes it? Achilles? The Atreides? I don't know. This is the only thing I see. Troy is falling. Priam's daughter's marriage to Achilles, a man bathed red and dripping Trojan blood. This dishonorable match would not have saved our state. The living might bring up the wedding wine, but all the while the dead cry out, give us blood, more blood. It is black blood I'm seeing. Our father throws his arms around the knees of men who execute his children. They're screaming, weeping, whimpering and howling. She howls. It is our mother, I know her voice. Almighty oh, gods, I beg you, take out this woman's tongue. Cassandra holds her head in her hands and stares terrorized into the middle distance. Alexina, crying, falls into under Mike's arms. Thank you so much, guys. Um, that was extremely powerful. And I, before we move on to the next extract, I just wanted to say how absolutely amazing and alive Nina's translation is. And I'm sure everyone will agree, and it's just such a treat to get to hear it performed by ac uh, actors. And, um, and the language just feels uh, so contemporary and just springs off the tongue. And it also just sounds like it was made to be um, read in English. Um, and, and I know that for the actors it's been such a joy to get to perform it and I wanted to ask you Nina about your decision because well um, I mean the way that the actors the kind of costumes that the actors have for um, this performance is based on your vision for how you see the play and how you see it as um, kind of adapted to the contemporary moment and like, how did that come to you? What was that? Where, why did you decide to think about Cassandra in the present day or kind of in a recent period? Thank you, Maria. That's that's a good question. Like I said, I think some of it is, again, as you mentioned, the language of the play is incredibly versatile and very fresh. What you are hearing is, I, I, I know translators say this, but, you know, I didn't have to do anything. I just had to be careful. Less Ukrainian's language is is really fresh. You're hearing all kinds of registers. You're hearing people being informal with each other, but also formal with each other. You're hearing Cassandra in prophetic state where she, her whole behavior changes. It's just the, the the text itself has given us so much to work with. And there, I just did a iambic pentameter on that line, which is what's in my head when I was translating. Um, and. I, I always say that you know nobody knows the text as well as the translator does because a translator yeah. turns it inside out and wears it and then takes it off and then wears it again, right? You have to live it. And so it was impossible not to hear the voices in my head. It was impossible not to imagine these things. And when I started translating, I looked up um, existing previous productions of Cassandra in Ukrainian. And I also listened to, to how it was done on an audio book. And um, I just felt that I wanted, I wanted a very relatable experience because I was just hearing these people in my head. And I watched um, two plays on TV. Uh, I watched the movie that Ray Fiennes, uh, Coriolanus, and Benedict Cumberbatch's, uh, Benedict Cumberbatch's um, Hamlet, which is also kind of a modernish dress production at the National Theater. And so, so I was hoping for something similar because um, as we go on, um, I think um, I'll have other opportunities to point out kind of where this where modernity applies. I should point out, however, that Leso Krenka was a great student of the classics, obviously, and, and of Greek classics, among all others. And she uses in this and her other plays, she uses the fact that in the Greek society, men and women were separated from each other, generally speaking. So they were women were on that side of the house and men were on that side of the house. Uh, what's interesting in Cassandra is because she's a prophetess and a priestess, she can 
transcend that private. She 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 comes out of that private women's sphere mm. into the public sphere, but she also goes back. And we will see some. We will see dynamics in this scene. We just saw three women together as the play unfolds. Cassandra moves further and further out of the palace. We see her on the walls of Troy. We see her in the temple. We see her in the public square. So it, it, the play is built as this expanding universe that we get to experience together with, um, with the performance. Yeah, super. Um, and I, as you were talking, I was just thinking that there might be people on the call that really don't know anything about Lesi Ukrainka at all. <laughs> and I have none, neither of us have given an introduction to her. I, I didn't manage to do that at the beginning. And um, that's where it is a shame that we don't have Sasha with us because she's an amazing expert on Lesi Ukrainka and she would be a much better moderator than me. Um, but hopefully Olesia now might be able to put in the chat uh, the link to the fantastic video um, that we that the Institute made as part of our series, 10 Things Everyone Needs to Know About Ukraine. And we recommend the whole series. You must watch all of the videos, especially now. Um, and one of them is about Lesi Ukrainka, and you can learn more about Ukrainka there. Um, Nina, can you remind us what uh, year Cassandra was written? 1908. 1908. Um, yes. So we'll Let's move on to the next extract, um, but there's much more to say, but we can come back to our conversation after after the second extract. So um, can you set the scene for uh, part two? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, so this is one of, uh, this is further in the play, quite, quite a bit deeper. And Cassandra's brothers, uh, Cassandra's brother, Deiphobus, who is now the leader of the Trojan army because Hector has been killed, has reached out to a neighboring king on a mouse um, for an alliance, for a military alliance. And king on the mouse said that he would like to marry Cassandra, which, all right. Um, all of this transpired without Cassandra knowing about it. So Deiphobus kind of shows up and her, comes to her and tells her this is happening and that she should um, speak to King on the Mouse and agree to the marriage. And this is the scene where King on the Mouse, of him, we know, we don't know a lot. We know that his country is richer and foreign. <laughs> it's a different country. That's what we get. <laughs> uh, this is where King on the Mouse finally enters Cassandra's quarters and they have a conversation. Have a listen. Good tidings, princess. Modesty is uh, something I prize highly. Still, I would like to hear you speak, if only just the word, the one that's owed me. Are you quite sure it's yours? Your father and brother assured me. So you have heard it from them. I've promised nothing yet. You have not asked. You've made no appeal to me, and here you are for my consent as if it's owed you. Forgive me, princess. I know the girls appreciate sweet talk, but I've got no aptitude for it. I speak my piece. It is not you, but I who sought your hand in marriage, which means I like you. It's not complicated. I want you for my wife. How can you? Surely you see I'm not yours in my soul. If I can have this shape, these eyes, these lips, this glorious regal body, where could the soul escape? It would be mine, however long it takes. Not any more than any slave girl's soul. <sighs> Don't bring in slaves, Cassandra. You'll be queen, as does befit my wife and daughter of King Priam. It doesn't fit her to live somewhere against her will, regardless. I'm not here to take you with an armed hand. You'll come of your own will. I could have made an alliance with the Greeks and ruined Troy and taken you as spoils of war. But I chose to ask your father honourably and take you only when I have won you by doing Troy a favour. In other words, you wish to buy me, King? All heroes, all the greatest, bought their wives this way. That was not heroic. 
A hero never counts the cost. But shouldn't heroism deserve reward? People and gods agree on this. Are you not steeped in glory? I am, and I don't care for any more. What I don't have, my princess, is a wife. So I take you. Already? I do not believe I've given myself yet. Princess, to be frank, I thought by asking, I would honour you as a priestess and a royal. In Lydia, we do not have the custom of coming to the girl whose father said yes. On a mouse. No. Such marriage to Cassandra will not end well. <laughs> Don't scare me, prophetess of prophecies. I do think fortune favours the strong, the brave and the decisive. Every woman loves such a man, and if she does not yet, she will. You do not know me, King, if you say so. I know lots of women. But Cassandra hasn't been one of them. And that's precisely why I wish to take her. It will be your doom. <laughs> I do not love you. Then one day you will. No. Never. I'll never love the man who made such use of our misfortune. I will be the man who saves your country. Don't count, King, as done what is still being weighed in Zeus's hand. But what if I do? Then to you, the victor, I'd give my gratitude and praise, provided he abandoned the idea of seeking me as his reward. Aren't you smart? Praise, gratitude, is that a fit reward? I could give a beggar leftover meat and hear in return more thanks and praises than I have useful. But have you ever seen how a nation greets its liberator? More than once or twice. And let me tell you, princess, the defeated praise just as much the victor. I've known both. In essence, they are the same. It's worship of those in power by those left without. To risk my host for this, that would be madness. I'm not a madman. To endanger my own self, my troops, all in exchange for praise and gratitude spoken in Trojan. I would rather go home without a fight and have Lydian women praise me for wisdom in our own tongue. Thank you. Um, so I have more questions to ask Mina, but why don't we move straight to the third extract and then chat a bit more? I think that makes sense. So I don't know what our spectators expect, but she did say yes. And um, King and the Mouse left was his agreement. There was a bit of to do outside to, to sort of continue the motivation of his troops. And Cassandra's other brother, very important person in her life, Cassandra's brother, Helenus, who is the other priest in Troy, the other uh, priest who is a prophet, said everything's going to be fine and said he saw signs in, in the flying doves. So at this point, Cassandra asks Helenus to come see her. He is the only person in Troy that she can talk to about prophecies, about the experience of, th of seeing things, the experience of foretelling the future. He is also a man, and I think there is a little bit of that shade of when Cassandra maybe doesn't, not quite sure what to think. This is the last time sort of in this play that she turns to the male authority, her older brother. So we are again in Cassandra's quarters. It's uh, Cassandra and Helenus. Please, brother, tell me honestly, what omens did you discern in bird flight? Now, the omens, you and I are prophets both and know well that birds and innards, the blood and smoke of burning sacrifice, all that is merely vestments and adornments to shield the naked truth from human eye. Truth is a modest and respected lady. She would be too ashamed to go nude. <laughs> but I, too, am a woman, which would mean that I can see the truth without vestments. Sister, tell me, who has ever seen the naked truth? I have, and much too often. 
Are you certain that the truth you saw you did not jinx with your notorious eyes? You, Helenus, have touched a bleeding wound. But I'll be brave. I'll take it. I'll endure. I genuinely wish to hear your advice. You are the wisest of all our brothers. Your mind is exquisite and limber like a flame. Or like a garter snake. Phrygian thinking. We Trojans have well learned over the time of siege to twist and coil like those simple snakes. What else to do? If you had seen Deiphobus contort himself before the Lydian king, you would have said, Oh look, another brother has grown as limber as a spineless snake. Don't mention such debasement, it's disgusting. Be honest, brother, tell me as your kin. Did you at any moment there believe, from watching birds or innards or whatever, that match to be our Troy's deliverance and the Lydians to bring it? That's quite a puzzle, sister. Um, to be honest, I did believe it. And then I also didn't. I don't understand. Well, at first, when I saw the Lydian force, spear bristling, numberless, full-hearted, fresh and keen, I did feel certain that the Greeks, exhausted by the siege, war-weary, could not hold out against a king who thirsts for battle. And this I know too, if we had put our faith in Helen's hand, or Polyxena's, or any other woman's but not yours, we would have won the day. Do you mean to say that all misfortune is Cassandra's fault? Not all of it, but most. <laughs> Brother! You asked for honesty, I gave you what you asked. But sister, please, I do not blame you. You cannot help it. Gods are the ones to blame for giving you the gift of seeing and denying the gift of marshalling the truth. Whenever you are visited by visions, you wring your hands, the terror petrifies you, as if the Gorgon caught you in her sight. You alarm the people. You make the truth more scary than it is, and folks lose their heads or act without heed, and when they perish, you say, I told you so. Well, what would you do? What I've been doing. I wrestle the truth. I hope to rein it in, to captain it. But what about the Moirai? Their will compels the world, but you would change it? Not so, Cassandra. The Moirai made it so there's the sea, the ship upon it, and the storms and rocks, the captain and the harbour. Hope among the struggle. Victory. The truth, of course. But also, not the truth. Then it is also by design that there be a Cassandra. And a Hellenist to fight her. This is the truth I see. I am here to free Troy from the sandbank where it's mired, thanks to Cassandra's truth. And you would free it with not the truth? What's the truth and what is not? People call whatever lies that chance to pass the truth. I had a slave who told me my killicks had been stolen, while in fact he didn't feel like looking for it. But while the slave delayed, someone did come and steal the cup. So, what was true and when? A razor's edge divides lies and the truth in hindsight. And in the moment, we have nothing. When someone speaks the words they don't believe themselves, that's clearly not true. And what if the speaker is in error but doesn't know it? Would that make it true? But then how do you ever tell them apart? I don't. I let them be. What of your prophecies? What do you tell the people? I tell them what they need to hear, what is useful, what makes them proud. That. Do you ever see what will come? Inevitable, certain? Do you not ever hear the voice inside your heart that says, it will be so, exactly so? Honestly, no, never. Then it is very hard for us to understand each other. Tell me, how are you able then to tell the public God's reveal, I have seen this, or heard this voice, when it is all untrue. Again, with true and not true, drop these words, they're meaningless. P perhaps you think that truth begets the speech. I think it's speaking that begets the truth. And uh, what are we to call such truth that's born of lies? Or will you tell me you've never counted at such birth? I have, more times than I could count. Word is fertile and bears more fruit than Mother Earth. You just said... You do what's useful, what makes people proud. Why then pretend to be a prophet? What's the use or pride in that? That is the point. 
If earlier today, our father, brothers, all the young and old of Troy, its men and women, begged the Lydians to come to our defence, it would have been in vain. That army would just have said, Cassandra, their prophetess, has hexed this war in marriage. But then I came in, fully vested in my authority as priest, decked out with a seer's diadem. When I raised my silver staff high above my head, it flashed like lightning into our allies' eyes. I said, silence! I have let fly the consecrated doves. We wait and see. All talk and rumbling ceased. I said, King Onomous has displeased Apollo when he failed to pray for his consent to seek his priestess, Cassandra, for a wife. The many-arrowed god let this offence be known in the message from Cassandra. We can yet repair this injury with sacrifice, an offering to Apollo that includes white oxen who had never known the yoke, a hecatomb. I vow to do so, King Onomous cried, and I then said, I see the doves, they have come back and tend to their fledglings. A happy omen for the foray and the match. And with these words, I beat you, my dearest truth-seeing sister. For how long? We'll have to see. You're right. Out in the field, it's not the Greeks who fight against our allies. It's you and I, in combat, hand to hand. Helenus wields courage. And you, Cassandra, come with despair armed. What if Cassandra wins? How will then Helenus explain his untruths? He will in public say, Onomous had doomed himself when he set out not having made the hecatomb. Apollo was not satisfied with the king's vow alone. In private, he will reason, one weapon's broken, we'll find another then. There's still more honour in dying armed than weaponless. Then should you have joined in the fight today with steel and helmet, not wearing your diadem? Men's weapons are too small for me. Men's hearts, those are my arms. I shoot words, not arrows. A host against a host, that is my jewel. I rule in people's minds. My diadem, this staff, these are the symbols of power that's greater than all kings. I do not have an equal among these heroes, leaders. You are alone, my equal. Maybe better. And we will fight till one of us is dead. I do not know myself if I would rather best you or lose to you today. I hate the very notion of that marriage. It's worse than death. I fear it even more than the defeat of our state. Use the Phrygian thinking, if you have it. Have you not heard how gods sometimes conceal their favourites in clouds? I have a secret space beneath the altar. When you stand there side by side with Honor Mouse to make the proper sacrifice, the offering will spout smoke, great mass of vapours, stench. And when the air clears, where you had stood, there would be nothing. Get it? Shame on you for advising this. Is this an honourable exit? I know it's a safe and useful one. I would rather fall on a sword. Infuriating on a mouse and still breaking your word. There would be neither honour or use in that, Cassandra. <sighs> we are not the same, but we are equal, if not in deeds, then in our ways of thinking. King Onomaus is slain. His army is scattered and in flight. Cassandra, you have won. It was not I, but Moira. I'm her tool. The Phrygian mind is exquisite and limber until Moira bent it and broke it with her heavy hand. The hardened hand that hammers people into the warheads of the world. You and I are mere rivets in the armor. We should be wary lest we do overestimate ourselves. Thank you, guys. Um, wow, so Nina. How does it, well, I want to ask you, how does it feel to hear your translation read now? But you don't have to answer that if you don't want, because if I was you, I would definitely just burst into tears answering that question. I am. You can't see it, but that's because the, the resolution is not <laughs> Okay, great. well, I won't ask you that question. Instead, um, let me ask you, um, what for you is the most important message in this play? That's an excellent question. Um, and like our spectators, I have the benefit, well, most, some of our spectators perhaps, of reading the entire play. 
And I think, and I, the way I read it, I think in the end, Cassandra um, gets her victory in a way. She, she does not warn King Agamemnon of impending doom and just more or less watches for the Nestor hack ax him to death, which is, you know, gory <laughs> and dies herself. But I think as I was just listening to that dialogue with Helenus, which is kind of the pivoting point of the, the core of the play, mm. um, it's that we are such, in politics, in, in functioning, in, in technocracy, we are so concerned with risk management, with reputation management, that we can find ourselves unprepared for a, an extreme scenario, which is what Cassandra sees. And that's a lesson to us all, I guess, risk management only goes so far. Also, if you have a woman who says she sees the future, you know, just listen to her, see what happens. Perhaps it's, <laughs> perhaps it's for the best, perhaps it's for the best. Um, and I, um, people in the audience might not know that I feel that you were perfectly placed to translate this play, not just because you're such a talented translator and poet, but also because of your experience in, um, I don't know the correct term, civil service or diplomacy. What exactly is it that you tell us about your other life? Foreign, foreign service, uh, US okay. foreign service. So in other words, I work for the State Department and no, it's not code for anything else. I work for the state. I mean, I'm a, I'm a foreign service officer and I do things like manage exchange programs. And if I were at the office right now, I'd be getting exchange students out of Ukraine and coordinating aid or doing something else, something like that. That's what we do. But it's a good, it's a good pivot for me to, I have a question from Thompson Milevich about um, whether there was a real life figure who reminded me of Cassandra. Um, and I can't say that there is a real life one. I can't think of one right now, but if you know the um, TV show West Wing, Nancy, who is the um, chair, chairwoman of the chief of staff, I believe, or, or national security advisor, chief national security advisor, is, is very, was very much on my mind, that character. Um, with a little bit more time, I might think of, I, I think it's a composite in my imagination. And of course I would like to be Cassandra, mine is the dying part, um, but I would like to have her moral fortitude and, and honor. Uh, thank you. Um, I was just looking at the other questions now. Um, and yes, and just kind of following on from what you were saying, um, sort of follow-up question is that this, uh, to what extent is the kind of vision that you have for the play based on your own experience of what it's like working in the State Department or the kinds of um, work that you've done or is it is that based on your own experiences as well a bit or, or, or not? I think it came out, it came out in rehearsals which means I probably was hearing it in my head, the dynamics between different people, between different levels of authority between men and women, the way that um, in the play, the military the military leaders have the final word and everything. Uh, they Phobos and Hector, even when they're not necessarily right, which sometimes happens, you know, the, the, force, the, force, has the, the force has the word. Um, the, the, the perhaps sort of the women, the fact that women live in a slightly more complicated world where there is there are these claims on their affections and emotions that perhaps men do not have. Um, I think played a role in it as well. I was trying also to think there was a question in the Q and A as well about whether this is a response to a contemporary events on behalf of Lesa Ukrainka. And unfortunately, um, this is where we need somebody like Dr. Dovzik or somebody who actually is a Ukrainka scholar. I do know that the play was, she started the play several years before she finished it. And so the events of the revolution of 1905 were, did happen while she was working on the play, but um, I couldn't tell you exactly what the textual evidence is for, for, for 
how how she's reacting to that. I do know that the play was received um, received um, responses as a as a play about Greeks and Lesya Ukrainka had a lot of fun about that and she had a lot to say about that. That my poor critics think this is an ethnographic study of the ancient Greeks and it, it's not. So tell us a bit about who, who it was about then and what, what symbolism there might be in the play or might have been at the play that she's referring to. I can't, I don't know the details, but from what I've, see, what I've seen in her letters and the things that I've read from her archives is that she clearly meant it as a, she clearly meant it as an allegory, right? She meant it to be, to be read as a, uh, as relevant to current events. So I don't know if she had anybody specific in mind. Um, to me, it doesn't feel like that. Mm -hmm. But again, I mean, to me, Cassandra feels like a, a truly sort of this towering character that just would not let go of the imagination of its creator and just had to be, had to be, you know, put where she needs to be rather than somebody who is based on a specific person, but I could be very wrong, so don't quote me on that. Sure, I mean, that's just another thing that from me, from reading your amazing translation and um, and thinking about this play and the extracts that we, um, uh, the actors performed this evening, you know, right now listening to the text, it just makes me think only about the current situation that we're in. But before now, um, and reading it previously, I was just so moved by this, um, by the way that Lassie Ukrainka explores what the truth and the fight for the truth and um, and Cassandra's uh, dedication to, well, kind of bravery and fighting for that, even when no one will listen to her. And I, I just wonder whether you can speak to that a little bit more. I think, What's interesting and what makes this play great is that we get to see Cassandra doubt mm. things. She, we, we talked during the rehearsals again and our wonderful actors are also here and can answer your questions as well if anybody is interested. Um, we talked about what the experience of seeing must be like for her based on the text and based on the text, it seems that as, as we saw in the first excerpt that we did, when she tells Polixena not to ask, she has to be asked. She has to be asked a question before she can give an answer. And otherwise it's kind of a vague, maybe sense of foreboding, mm -hmm. um, which I think is interesting, right? So she's not entirely in control of her yeah. gift or curse, however you want to say it. And, and it seems, but nonetheless, she functions as a prophetess. We see her writing in her sibling book. We see her attending to the temple. She's perfectly, you know, she she is a a priestess in her own right, minus being the prophetess. It's just that she's a she's an expert at what she does, and so there are moments in the play where neither we nor Cassandra can be sure that it wasn't her words or literally what she says that brings trouble. Uh, there's a key moment where she shouts out the name of her beloved and we are left to decide whether it's her in the battlefield and therefore discloses his position or not. Nobody knows. She, Cassandra being distraught, thinks that she did. And so tries to speak less, but cannot. Like this, this experience just has to come out. It is possible that that's why she decides to to tell yes, to say yes to King on the Mouse, because at that point she's trying to deny what she sees mm. at that point in the play. And then I find the epilogue where she, Agamemnon, tells her, you're no longer in Troy. I'm not Trojan. I will believe you. Tell me what's going to happen. And this is her one chance to be heard and taken seriously. And she says, I'm not going to tell you. And lets him walk to his death because he is the enemy. And that, that of course, is something, you know, heroes do not count the cost, mm. as she says. Um, and she is an embodiment of that. 
Um, it, the, I just noticed that in the Q&A, some of it, Joel Mackler, um, uh, I, I wonder whether Joel would be happy to ask his question via video. So um, I will, Joel, could you write in the chat if you are happy to, and if you are, then I'll um, put you on video to ask a question. I know that I've just answered half of it, uh, not I just, have, but Nina has just answered half of it, but maybe she can answer the second half. Um, and in the meantime, uh, and the same for Yaroslava Barbieri, if you would like to answer your, ask your question over video, please can you say yes in the chat? And then I'll promote you to panelists so that you could ask it. But before that, we have an anonymous question, so they definitely won't join via video. And they ask <laughs> when your translation is going to be available as an ebook and where can they find it, Nina? <laughs> That is a fantastic question and thank you very much for being interested. At this point, I can only say watch this space. We are working, uh, and by we, I mean sort of the translated and the other Ukrainians to London and everybody we know. It, we're looking for a publisher and we hope to find one soon and be able to um, be able to advertise that um, soon. And if you follow the news from Ukrainians to London, I hope you'll see it. And uh, really, thank you very much for that. And I just can't wait to see this play on stage, Nina. Um, and it must happen and we'll make sure that it does. Um, so I think Joel has said that he would like to ask his question via video. So I'm promoting him to panelists now and he should appear very shortly. Hopefully you can start your video, Joel, now. Uh, hey, can you hear me? Yes. yes, we can. Okay, so I will read my question um, that does not exist anymore. I can't pull it up, but it's basically um, so obviously, uh, you, you know, there, you know, we'll, we'll me, you know, re look, listening to this today, right, where my mind's already, you know, half on, uh, you know, the, the war in Ukraine um, uh, issues of um invasion you know questions of truth um you know are uh, are like central are you know are obviously in this play uh one question that i another question that i had was um is like what i in some ways perhaps this was already somewhat answered like what would uh ukraine you know what was she, what did she have in mind when she was doing this right um and uh, what, like, what does war mean to her, like, as a concept? Mm -hmm. So that's just, you know, what I had. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you, Joel. And uh, again, I'd have to send you to, to people who are more informed than I am, but I do believe I have some evidence to say that um, the fogs of war were rising, right? In, and and it, I have seen it said that the sort of, the trans, excuse me, the trends that eventually produced World War I were in motion. Um, I have to think of the events of 1905 was sort of the semi-revolution. Uh, certainly we probably could say that, you know, the early 1900s is when life was changing rapidly. Uh, communication was changing rapidly. So newspapers and sort of, I would imagine that, well, actually, I've, I've read newspapers from that period and the, their standards of reporting were not the same as we have today. So the questions of what's the truth, what's not the truth, and where is it, gonna, where is it going to take us, um, I, I think we're certainly on, on Lesa Ukrainka's mind. But beyond that, I'm afraid I can't speculate, but I can send you to, to um, Sasha Dobzhuk's work and also um, primary sources and, and well, other places, watch this space. If this play comes out, it will come out, uh, I hope it will come out with a foreword by somebody who is a Lesa Ukrainka expert. So, so this is very valuable for us to collect these questions and, and direct them at a person who is going to be better prepared to answer those. <laughs> you did a brilliant job there. Um, and we've got a question from Yaroslava now. You're muted at the moment, Yara. Oh, sorry. Uh, thank you so much for organizing this event. I think it's yet again a demonstration of how um, pieces of literature are not just 
texts that should be discussed in the context of some, you know, academic meetings that actually have incredible depth for us to also understand contemporary events. Um, so, and also incredible to have, you know, a little bit of soothing effect from art, uh, since we're, you know, drugged with political news. Um, I, I hope it won't sound like a stream of consciousness, but I couldn't help but thinking that um, uh, in the context of the contemporary events, we've been facing two different Cassandras. So there have been the Cassandras of the world that did not predict that the war would happen. And they predicted that if a war would happen, Ukraine would fail. And then this Cassandra embodied by Ukraine itself that knew that a war would be coming and is certain that it shall prevail. So my question is, how do you think that Lassia Ukrainka's interpretation of Cassandra helps us make, uh, make sense of competing truths when we speak about politics, competing predictions of the future? I hope it, it's, it's not contorted, but it really struck me to, you know, the figure of Cassandra as someone who predicts the future. And, and, and here we have two different tragic predictions of the future. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's that's an excellent question, Yaroslava. I'm um, possibly of the third camp um, you, of the U.S. and Western intelligence that supported the long-held Ukrainian suspicion that there's going to be a war. Um, had high, high with high confidence, there were folks who predicted that, and then there was just we're dealing with this just non-belief in that particular truth, right? How can you possibly deny an army outside your city walls? Precisely. Um, we don't know what happened at the beginning of the Trojan War in this play, what happened to Cassandra. We do know that when Helen of Sparta first came to Troy, Cassandra predicted there's going to be terrible doom. And we get the sense that Yes, there is a siege, but it's more like a frozen conflict. It's like a protracted negotiation, right? So they've been sitting, Troy is not falling, Greeks are not leaving, right? Achilles proposes to marry Polyxena. You know, there's marriages happening. At some point, somebody points out that, look, Menelaus may not really care for Helen anymore. It's been 10 years. There's a whole new generation of Spartan women that he could marry. I mean, come on. Um, it has been a frozen conflict and then something tips it, tips it over. Um, we don't get to see, we don't get to see exactly what it is. It's just kind of the mass of forces and the, the fact that it is preordained. I haven't spent as much time thinking about this, the sense of fate in this play where, where Cassandra, Cassandra's argument is that, that there is fate, there is, the arc of history and it bends towards the fall of Troy. Um, and that's her, that's her claim to ultimate prophetic authority. Unfortunately, that is not the claim that we can make in modern day, except when we can, when we can say, look, the art of history, the arc of history bends toward the victory of the liberal democracy. And this is the war we are fighting. So I think what we are to take from it and what Les Ukrainka's brilliance in this play is, is to show us what people go through personally, emotionally, as they navigate these things. You can be absolutely certain that you're right. You can know that what you're seeing is going to happen. And yet when everybody around you challenges it, how do you continue? And everybody tells you that by voicing these things, by speaking these things. I cannot tell you how many times people say in the play, will you take this woman's tongue? Will you go mute? Will you, will you stop talking? So like, if you speak it, it will happen because it's too terrible to face. But then it happens. And the last words in the play are Cassandra's words who says, there's life, there's just life. As Troy burns, the survivors are huddled together as prisoners. And she says, life, life goes on. You, you were too afraid to face it. And yet here we are. Can I just add one little question to this? Because I'm just so fascinated by this thought. So you mentioned about fate. So how do we 
how can we understand the role of agency? Given if Cassandra has a deterministic view of the future, so she knows something Dune is going to come, where does agency fit in, in the figure of Cassandra? Obviously, she feels compelled to speak. She cannot be silent. Even though she knows nobody listens to her, she's well aware that's her curse. We also know she does other things. So she, she, she does, she, she takes other action as well. Um, so it's not, it's a, it's, a, it's a central question in the play, you know, where is it? Do you wrestle truth? She doesn't see truth as something to be wrestled with. It's something that kind of picks her up and carries her and, and she's 100% certain it's going to happen. So it's not her role to, she doesn't have a choice. She doesn't necessarily feel like she has a choice to change what's coming, but she has a choice to speak or not to speak. And as a patriot, patriot and a citizen and a member of the royal family, she chooses to speak over and over and over again until she finally gets Agamemnon killed. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. That was great. Thank I hope you. that was helpful. Um, okay, so it's half past seven in London now. Um, I'm just trying to change time zones in my head. Um, so we still got half an hour, right? Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Um, super. Well, we've got another really great question from Anna Lucas, who says the debate between brother and sister on the nature of truth is extraordinarily contemporary. Did you play that up in your use of language? <laughs> it was quite challenging, actually, because, and I'm glad, I'm glad, thank you, Anna, for asking this question. I'm glad we're getting to it. Um, is, um, sorry, I just saw another question in the Q&A. I got distracted for a second. It's very curious, in the play, Lesa Ukrainka does not use the word lies. She uses words truth and not truth. Pravda in the pravda. And so one choice that I made was to preserve that. If she doesn't use the word lies, then we, then I didn't feel like I could either because it's a little bit different, right? Napravda is just something that is not true. Whereas a lie is something that is constructed mm, okay. for purpose as not true. Hence the conversation with Helen, who also gets this difference, I think, understands it quite well. He just doesn't care. He just says, you know, there's, you have the truth, I have the, I mean, there's, there's untruth and untruth and truth and who cares what the truth is, we just have untruth. And he's, he's a structuralist, we're constantly approaching the truth and we can never get there. We can only get a little closer. Um, so that's one thing that is definitely was a point of language. Um, the only, okay, not the only, it's, it's, you go line by line and you, you translate sort of you get into the scene and you try to hear the voices and then you translate and you try to stay, you know, you stay um, faithful to the text. Um, and I think I'm gonna wrap in here the response to another question that's appeared in the Q and A is about whether I'm aware of translation by Vera Rich in the 1960s. I am, I read that. In fact, I had that open uh, on my desktop as I was translating because um, it is, um, it's useful to know what, what how other translators solve some problems. Um, I just felt like that translation along with previous stagings of Cassandra that I saw were of a, were, what should I say? Committed, thoroughly committed to the allegorical power of the play. Whereas I wanted to make it, I felt it, I read it and heard it as a very um, here and now mm. in my I imagination. Think that's, um, I'm so pleased that you did take that approach because I, I really am excited to see it on stage in English and it's gonna work because the language is so fresh and alive in the way that you've translated it. Um, and the way that you've brought out the universal themes that were already there, but you've just kind of brought them um, to the now. Um, and gosh, I mean, with the events right now in Ukraine, um, it's, it, that's taken it, this is all taken it to yet another layer. Um, 
Um, uh, okay, we've got another another question uh, from Philip Romanelli. Um, how much does the playwright take from the lumberyard of Greek myth? And how much does she create herself? Everything that happens in the play happens in the Iliad. Every, or rather everything that, okay, not everything that happens in the Iliad happens in the play, but all the events, every name that's mentioned other than perhaps um, possibly the slaves, but every everybody who's referenced as, as having come to the aid of Troy and fallen, or you know, every intrigue is what happens in Iliad. So it is a very close reading of the Iliad. Um, I am not again not a classicist, so I don't I don't remember my Iliad to the extent that I can tell you that line is in the Iliad and that one isn't. Um, but I wouldn't put it past Lesa Ukrainka to lift lines from the Iliad and um, pull them. But she basically, she takes the character, she takes the situations, and then she writes the dialogue by, I think, placing herself among them and asking, as an artist does, what would this feel like? Mm. Well, that's fantastic, because I feel like you've done the job of kind of then taking that to now as well. So you've, um, that's, that's wonderful. Um, uh, so Nina, are there any questions that I haven't asked you that you wish you'd been asked? Or um, <laughs> does anybody else have any more questions? Because I think we don't have any more. In oh, we do. We've got one more from an anonymous attendee. Do you right. struggle with the balance between paying homage to the original writer and infusing your own interpretation when you translate? Um, should there even be a balance at all? If not, <laughs> Which way do you think is better to lean into? I think the best way to achieve this balance is to pick outstanding works of literature. And then it's easy. <laughs> and I'm only half, I'm only half joking. The fact that the, the quality of the text that determines how hard the translator has to work is control and discipline. How much in control is the writer over the text? Is there is every word in other ways exactly what the writer wanted? With Lesa Ukrainka, we can trust that it is. I see no, I see no evidence line by line of hesitation or you know, something left on sort of maybe not exactly, I don't know, revise it later. Every line does work, every line and and again, I think I this is the first time I translated the play. So some of it may be due to the fact that this is drama. But I also, I've always thought that Lesia Ukrinka was a wonderful writer of drama. She's just specifically, particularly gifted in that form where she only has dialogue and she packs so much in and she has such register. So the register, again, from casual, I have offended you, I'm sorry, to we are the rivets in the missiles of the world in the armor of the world, it's wonderful. And it's all less, you know, I'm just choosing, maybe in a couple of places I chose words that were, I know I chose um, missiles a couple of times as opposed to javelins or something more specific like spears or something like that, but it's not unfaithful, right? It's, it's the flying things. Absolutely. And, yeah. You know, other than that, I really didn't have to, the whole thing about the, the hawk and the dove, that's less Ukrainian, that, that was there. I didn't, I had a choice of keep it or change it. And in fact, the translator sometimes has to do that, something that's in the original text. When I wrote the first draft and showed it to people, one of the comments was, are you sure you want this metaphor? Because it's really loaded in today's language. Mm. It wasn't in less Ukrainian's language, in less Ukrainian's time. Right, it's not a thing, but it was just so perfect that I was gonna keep it, and so I did. Yeah, you definitely made the right choice. Definitely made the right choice. Um, one more question, or maybe it's a comment. I'm not sure yet. Is that um, there have been quite in theatre there have been quite a lot of adaptations of Greek myths recently. Um, or even staging or a kind of adap adapted version. I mean, you kind of, you brought up Coriolanus earlier, but it's just so extraordinary that this was, and I've forgotten the year again. What 1908. 1908, mm -hmm. that Lassie Ukrainka 
adapted the story of the, well, not the, or the history or the myth or whatever we feel that it is of the Trojan War um, from the point of view of Cassandra. And, um, and I just hope that you could speak to that a little bit and, and how amazing that is. And that that's something that we kind of, people speak about as being something really important that we've been doing only just recently because yeah, no. it tends often to be through the voices of, uh, of men. Um, but Lesia Ukrainka was doing that back in 1908, if I got the date. Well, before right? and after as well. Yeah. Um, I haven't read all her plays, but every single one that I read has a female protagonist and is interested in what is concerned with what the woman is going through, right? Um, so everything I know about Lesia Ukrainka's oeuvre, I learned from Dr. Dobzhek, so please. Yeah, and, and I really must say, please do watch the video that's in chat and... Um, I'll, if Alessia's there, maybe she can post it again, and if not, I will in a minute, but really watch it, and um, we'll definitely be doing more events on Alessia Ukrainka with Sasha, so keep an eye out for that whenever it is that we do that, and I believe there's also, there definitely is a recording of um, our event at the British Library, um, yeah. which we did back in November, where we, where we had Oksana Zabushko, who Nina translated some of her works, she joined us via Zoom, and, um, and we had Sasha, um, and um, we, yeah, and that was that was celebrating the 150th anniversary uh, of um, Lesia Ukrainka's mm -hmm. birthday, um, and that is also on our YouTube channel. And you can and the, and Oksana Zabushko and Sasha speak a lot more about Lesia Ukrainka there. Um, so we really, really recommend that to watch mm -hmm. as well. Um, and in the short video, Sasha speaks about a bit about some of the other works by um, Lesia Ukrainka too. Um, so in I would, that, yeah, I would say what strikes me, just the last comment that occurs to me um, as we speak, what strikes me about this play and some other places, the sensitivity to the, the sensitivity that Lesia Ukrainka had. And this is something that I think goes to that question about what might she have been dealing with at the time when she was writing is the question of basically what is national identity? Is it and the role that linguistic identity, language identity, cultural identity, but also civic identity plays in that. And I think it's it's very, it's a tangled question. It's a question that we're still not very good at dealing with because the human experience of identity is multifaceted. We all experience ourselves as different things at different times and several things at once. Um, but I think it's very topical in the time when misinformation or the narratives, the, the narratives of our, um, of those who wish us ill are built on, are presumed to impart a shared identity based on, the same identity based on some shared historical identity and disregard the civic values that exist. In other words, I can feel, I feel Ukrainian. My, when my husband asks me who I feel myself to be, I usually say a Hellitian, but there's so much in that. I also say like, a, you know, a subject of Austro-Hungarian empire. A Hellitian of a very specific time and space. Um, civic identity is as powerful as linguistic um, or cultural identity. And we should not, this is, this is the basis and this is the claim to belonging in the European community. This is what we talk about when we talk about belonging in the European community. It's how we feel and how Cassandra, I think, also feels. She feels like a citizen and a patriot and then other things later. Thank you, Nina. I'm really glad that you um, added that. Um, Patrick Morris has another question, and um, I'd love for Leah, Alona, um, Andrea, and Charlie, if you can, to put your videos back on, because I believe this is a question to you guys. Hi. Um, that was a very fa fascinating point you were just making about civic identity, uh, Nina. So it's a question, yeah, for any of the actors, really. I'm, I'm interested in the 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 in in how the impact really of speaking the text um had upon you um and and 
you're encountering that with with the other actors because the text is so is so powerful and so clear there's there's no kind of ums and ers and and naturalism in there it comes straight from the soul and yet it's so articulate so i'm interested in just how you experience that and nina just another question for you is there anything that you are still trying to understand about the play Thank you. I would like to hear from the actors first and then see <laughs> and, and, and and then see what they come up with. <laughs> Andrea, can you go? Um, sure. Um, I'm just trying to uh, remember the question to make sure I stay on topic. Um, so the question was, um how did it how did it feel to be speaking the text and responding um to the other characters um i think uh, one of the things that we discussed in in rehearsal uh with nina um was just how natural the text felt in the mouth and like saying it um and that was something that's quite surprising for a text that is not necessarily from today and also is in translation uh, there wasn't anything about it that felt um, odd um, to speak, I don't think. And um, I think that responding to other to the other actors, I think that's you know that's always a hurdle on Zoom. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think that there's a wonderful fluency in fluidity, I should say, fluidity in the text between um, the fact that there isn't always um, a reply from the other character, it might just be a look. And there's a sensitivity in the characters that the characters are sensitive to one another in that way that I think we don't really, I don't know, um, it's, it's something that's really wonderful to see in a written play. Um, and I'll let someone else say stuff now. I can uh, jump in there in that um, the, it, it's obviously, and I've given the setting as well, um, it's in some ways the text the language is relatively heightened because it has to be it's dealing with uh, predicting the future it's dealing with gods and uh, obviously things that we don't um, take so much for granted these days um, and yet it again yet yeah, still somehow manages to shift between those um, between those levels of one moment talking about um, the future and the heavens and then the next talking about a very simple story like uh, in the case of Helenus having his cup stolen. Uh, and it seems to shift very um, seamlessly. Um, and that's, yeah, it's, so it sort of occupies this very special kind of register, I think. And in terms of the dialogue with um, um, with the other actors, it, um, I, I, found, I find myself, whenever it's um, about to be my line, just sort of raring to go, <laughs> sort of chomping at the bit because it's so, um, it feels so urgent, I think, the text. And um, there's a real momentum to it that um, I, I I mean, yeah, I, I just get completely swept along with, so, yeah. Thank you, Charlie. Um, Leia or Alona, do you have anything to add or before we hand back to Nina? I can't remember what the question was to you now, Nina. Oh, is there anything about the play that you are still um, working out for yourself or still waiting to find out? Oh my God, so many things. <laughs> um, I want to agree with Charlie that the text has this feeling of urgency or fluidity, whatever it is, is this magical quality that carried me with it. It's like, you can't, it's hard to pick an excerpt to translate. You just kind of keep going. You can't, you can't, it carries you with it. You, it really has that drive. I have my opinions as a as a as a translator and as a close reader and as a literary critic. I have my opinions about what happens when whether or not whether regarding whether or not Cassandra does kill her ex, her betrothed, the lawn, the one that she loved, if that's what happens there. I would love to know what Les Ukrainka meant like what she what she thought it would have been great to have a few more notes from her about the play and then i was fascinated there are stretches when 
there are stretches when the, the 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 stage directions don't exist, like they're abandoned completely, and it's just dialogue. And frequently, like with Cassandra and Helen, is there are chunks of fairly long speech. And as I was translating, obviously you focus on the text, but again, as as, as Patrick, you point out, it's I try to imagine what the other character in the room is doing at that time. And, and that's that's a fascinating experiment. Um, and I still, you know, you can do this. I think you can do this a lot and endlessly and, and it's open to interpretation, of course, which is also the beauty of the text. Thank you, Nina. Um, so, I think we'll start to wrap up the event now, but I just want to say a huge congratulations to you for your absolutely amazing translation that we are all so grateful that we had the chance to hear this evening at this time. Um, I know that for me, this has been extremely moving and, um, and I, I'm really, we're so grateful to everybody that joined us tonight. Um, we hope that it, you've enjoyed the event too and that it might have offered a bit of solace in the situation that we're all in right now. And um, I'd also like to say that we have done our best with extremely limited resources and unbelievable amount of requests that the Institute is receiving at the moment. Um, and our director, Alessio Haromechuk, is doing the most phenomenal job um, speaking with leading media and government and um, doing everything that she can for Ukraine at the moment. And um, in we have also been trying and actually, um, <laughs> Leia and Andrea and Alona have uh, been helping me in all kinds of ways um, as well at the moment, um, outside of their normal work as actors, um, because everybody is trying to do what they can for Ukraine right now. But we have made an, a, um, a page on our website with um, ideas of what everyone can do at the moment and to try to feel a little bit less lost and to try to do what each of us can. Um, and I will put it in the chat now. So please have a look and please also write to, to us. Um, uh, our, our email address is also on the website. If you have ideas of other places or other ideas of what people can do now, um, let us know. We, we, um, it, we've got such a crazy number of emails at the moment to go through that it's impossible to get through them quickly, but hopefully tomorrow we'll have a bit more chance to go through them and we will. Every email that gets written to that email box, I promise that it will be me that goes through it and I promise that I will. And, um, and if you have more ideas of things that we can do, then we will try to do them. And um, we're just sending solidarity to everyone on the call and um, praying for the best. And, um, and we are in absolute admiration of all of our Ukrainian family and friends and colleagues on the ground with everything that they're doing right now because their courage is absolutely extraordinary. Um, and um, somebody's asking about whether the recording will be available. I don't know. I think somebody needs to advise me whether it can be available. <laughs> um, but I hope so. We are recording it and usually we put our events on our YouTube channel. Um, so Nina, thank you so much again. Um, and thank you, um, Andrea, Alona, Leia and Charlie and Jonathan had to um, head off. But I, for me personally, this event has been um, absolutely what I needed um, and say so thank you all.